ethyl acetate and ethanol are flammable. The experiment should be performed in a film hood or in a well-ventilated area. In a previous video, we have made some methyl acetate by means of a classic Fischer stilification reaction. Unfortunately, the final product turned out to be contaminated with significant amounts of ethanol. In today's video, we will try to purify the crude ethyl acetate by means of fractional distillation. For this experiment, we will be using the crude ethyl acetate obtained in a previous video and a general fractional distillation setup. First, the crude ethyl acetate is poured in a clean and dry Lemaire flask equipped with a magnetic stirring bar. It is actually important to use a dry flask, as we want little to no water to be present during the fractional distillation. Then, a regular fractional distillation setup is assembled. This setup is actually the same used for a simple distillation, except for the fact that a fractionating column is placed between the flask and the tea head. The solution is then heated up under constant stirring. After a while, the solution will start to boil. This actually happens at a temperature at which the vapor pressure of the components of the solution matches the external pressure, which in my case is around 985 millibars. The vapors will then rise through the column and they will get partially condensed in its plate. Actually, we could assume that a pseudo equilibrium situation is achieved at the surface of its plate. This makes the vapor phase in equilibrium with the liquid one return richer in the most volatile species, whereas on the other hand, the liquid slowly becomes richer in the less volatile ones. And this is actually the working principle behind fractional distillation. The vapors will then rise all the way to the T head and finally to the condenser. At this point, the thermocouple should give us a rating corresponding to the normal boiling point of either a pure substance or an isotrope. And finally, the vapors are then condensed and collected. Usually, fraction distillation is able to separate two volatile liquids having a minimum difference in their boiling points of around from 10 to 20 degrees. All right, so now let's have a look at the normal boiling points of the species present in our solution. As we can see, both ethanol and ethyl acetate have very close boiling points, which actually makes them very difficult to be separated from each other. Besides that, as we can see, there are actually three possible isotopes to be formed between water, ethyl acetate and ethanol, and all three of them have very close boiling points. This is indeed the reason why it's so important to remove all the water from the solution before carrying out the distillation. Now, assuming that we have successfully removed all the water from the solution, we should be left with the just ethanol, ethyl acetate and the acetate ethanol isotrope. And then, assuming that ethanol is actually just a minor component in the solution, we should be distilling the acetate ethanol isotrope and then pure ethyl acetate. The different fractions were then collected according to the temperature reading given by the thermocouple. Normally, there is a relatively large difference in the boiling points of the different fractions being collected. However, in this case that we have seen so far, the boiling points of each of the possible species to be collected are very close to each other, and therefore the fractions have to be collected in accordance to every small change in the temperature reading given by the thermocouple. When only about 10 to 20 ml of solution are left in the flask, the distillation can be considered to be finished. At the end, I've collected a total of 6 fractions, with boiling points ranging from 67 to 70 degrees. The first 4 fractions were actually pretty close to each other, having boiling points of around 68 degrees. On the other hand, fraction 5 has a slightly greater boiling point, ranging from 69 to almost 70 degrees. The last fraction was the overlet solution in the flask, and as you can see, it is slightly cloudy, which may indicate the presence of some water or ethanol in the solution. Alright, so now let's have a look at the Raman spectra of the first four fractions. 
As we can see, the four first fractions have a very similar Raman spectra, corresponding almost entirely to pure ethyl acetate. All the Raman peaks actually correspond to this molecule, except for the 880 Raman peak, which indicates that there is still some ethanol present within our product. Alright, now let's compare the Raman spectrum of fraction 5, shown in red, with that of fraction 4. Apparently, they are quite close to each other. However, if we zoom in in this region, we can clearly see that in fraction 5, there is a relative increase in the intensity of the Raman peak associated with ethanol, and hence a decrease in the Raman intensity of the signal associated with ethyl acetate. And therefore, we can conclude that fraction 5 is mainly ethyl acetate with a slightly more significant amount of ethanol present in it. These two Roman peaks are actually very significant to discriminate between ethyl acetate and ethanol. Let's have a look to the normal version modes of these molecules. As we can see, in the case of ethyl acetate, the Roman peak is probably associated with a carbon, oxy and carbon vibration mode. Whereas, on the other hand, in the case of ethanol, the Raman peak is likely to be associated with a general aliphatic vibration mode. Alright, and now, finally, let's see the Raman spectrum of fraction 6, which as you can see corresponds almost entirely to pure ethanol. Here is indeed a comparison between the Raman spectrum of pure ethanol, shown in black, and the Raman spectrum of fraction 6, shown in red. As we can see, fraction 6 corresponds mainly to pure ethanol, with slight traces of ethyl acetate. And therefore we can conclude that we have successfully removed a great amount of ethanol from our crude product. Based on the results, the first four fractions were collected together, obtaining a total mass of 73 grams of ethyl acetate. And finally, here we have a comparison of the Raman spectrum of our product, shown in red, and the Raman spectrum of pure ethyl acetate, shown in black. As we can see, they are almost in perfect agreement with each other, and therefore we can conclude that we have finally obtained a nearly pure sample of ethyl acetate. Additionally, the density of our final product turned out to be almost coincident with that of pure ethyl acetate. Therefore, and assuming that we have obtained 100% pure ethyl acetate, we have obtained a final yield of 83%. Thanks for watching.